Welcome to my world. I'm your host, Kevin Rutherford. It is Friday, July 14th. It is a Friday free for all. We're going to open the phone lines right now, and I'm just going to sit here and be quiet until you call. 855-950-3835. Jump in and join me. We'll get to those calls here as soon as they start to come in. I've got some things we can talk about, I can talk about till some calls start to come in. I got a couple things. Unfortunately, it's news and politics and health. Uh, I've been avoiding news a lot, and I like it. It's helping my stress levels some. I got to climb out of this pit I've created, doing a little too much biohacking. Now I have to biohack my way back out of it. But staying away from the news is helping. I decided I would check in once a week. Not sure why I decided to check in on Friday morning. Uh, Maybe it's so I can just talk about it, get it over with, and then move on to the weekend. Because the news kind of makes me crazy when I look at it. Uh, Here's a couple things. This one really, really makes me crazy. I I can't even believe we're considering this, arguing about it, debating it. Um, The Supreme Court's already ruled on this, but this administration just seems to ignore the Supreme Court. You know, we have had, I guess... Uh, the best system of government that humans have ever created, except even it has become so corrupted. Uh, We have three branches of government to counterbalance so that government never gets too much power. That's the whole point. The founders really knew human behavior and they set up a pretty incredible system and yet human behavior figured out a way to corrupt it and screw it all up. So the third branch is there for even more checks and balances, the Supreme Court, the judiciary. But this administration just wants to ignore their rulings and just keep pushing. And I'm talking about the student loan forgiveness. This one just makes me insane for so many reasons. They tried to push it through. The Supreme Court said, Not no, but hell no. You can't do this. And yet they're trying it again. Um, $39 billion worth of student loan debt for more than 800,000 borrowers. Now, I've heard all the reasons it's crushing these people. I don't care. I really don't. You made the decision to borrow money. You borrowed the money. You paid for college. You went through college. You got the benefit of it. Pay it back. That's the end of it. There is no way I and you and everybody else that pays taxes should be responsible for paying this money back for anybody. Why are we only forgiving student loan debt? Why not mortgage debt? People are struggling with their mortgages. Let's just pay those off too. What about people who borrowed money to start a business and then failed? Because that's kind of what these college people are saying. I paid too much money for my education. It didn't get me a good enough job to be able to pay back that money. And now I want everybody else to pay it back for me. Uh, What if I borrowed the money and started a business and failed and now I have all this debt? It's crushing those people. Pay their debt back. And I'm saying this tongue in cheek. We should not be paying anybody's debt back. (sighs) Personal responsibility has just been completely lost, and there is a reason for it. There is a big picture here. Talk about black helicopters or conspiracy theories, whatever you want, but there is a clear theme and pattern to all of these problems when you start looking at what's going on. Everything from the southern border problems to the health issues to debt, just on and on and on, and here's what it is. This is a government or governments around the world creating populations that are easy to control. That is the major theme going on here. Why would you pay off this debt if you're trying to control people? Well, those people are in your debt now to the government. They may not owe any money, but are people like that going to continue voting for people like that? Hell yes. That's what's going to happen. So 
What's another reason for doing something like this? Well, it creates a lot of division. It really pisses off about half of the country, and the other half thinks it's wonderful. There's a clear divide there. People who are fighting amongst themselves are much, much easier to control. Why is the trans issue so big when it's really not a big issue? It's a tiny, tiny part of the population. And yet it gets blown so out of proportion and so much time in the media is spent about it that it becomes normalized. But what does it do? Creates a huge divide in the country. And we're fighting amongst ourselves much, much easier to control. What, how does the southern border affect this? Well, let a whole bunch of people from third world countries come here and get a bunch of benefits. And guess who they will vote for for life? The Democrats. Again, those people are much, much easier to control than we are. Well, half of us anyway. What was the whole COVID thing about? Control. We can make you put a diaper on your face. And then not only will we make you put a diaper on your face, we'll make you scream at other people who don't. Control and division. Everything that's going on today is about control and division. Division and control, because ultimately it's about control. Division is just another tool. Give people a bunch of stuff. That's a way to get them to vote for you. Get them fighting with the other side about giving you a bunch of stuff. And while they're busy, we can just go on with more and more and more control. The the uh, student loan thing, honestly, just makes me insane. I, I I know there's a lot of issues going on in the world today. This one absolutely makes me crazy. They're going to continue pushing this down our throats. They're going to do this. They'll find a way is what it looks like. Uh, Supreme Court be damned. Uh, just we're going to do this. I don't get it. All right, let's see. Uh, what else did I have up here? Um, the health issues. Why would the government be involved in all of these health issues with drugs and diet recommendations and all that kind of stuff? Well, sick people are much, much easier to control than healthy people. Sick people are dependent on the system. They're dependent on drugs and availability of drugs and cost of drugs and cost of health insurance. And it, 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 many of the those people want the government to take over our health insurance. Talk about even more control. And then every time we have a problem with some other group, I'm talking about the trucking industry now, we want to run out and have them regulated. Boy, the government just loves that. More regulations equals more control. We got to stop this. We got to stop thinking the government is the answer to everything. The government is the answer to almost nothing. We need to get back to a constitutional government. I don't see how it's ever going to happen. I really don't. I, I hate to be such a pessimist, but I, I really, I, I don't know how we get back to that. So here's uh, here's another government health issue, um, health officials. Well, who the hell are health officials? Well, they're government bureaucrats. They're half the time they haven't even earned their position. They haven't been voted and they've been appointed by somebody. It's the old boy network. Except the old boy network now includes everybody. It's not just old white men anymore. It's the elite politicians. They install these health officials. Now they claim classify as at aspartame, that's an artificial sweetener that's in an awful lot of food, most sodas, possibly carcinogenic, despite limited evidence. That's the headline. Health officials classify aspartame possibly carcinogenic, despite limited evidence. Well, how much evidence did they have that the vaccination worked? None. Zero. They had no long-term testing whatsoever, and yet they claimed over and over and over, it's safe and effective, it's safe and effective. It's not either one. And they had no data to show that it was either one. Do you know how many studies there are on aspartame? 
and and on aspartame directly about cancer? Thousands, thousands of them. And almost every one of them, if you skip the summaries and the conclusions, you find out that there's a very strong correlation between the consumption of aspartame and higher cancer rates. There is tons of evidence, but these are the headlines. They're finally forced. They would rather not even run this article at all, but there's enough pressure out there that they kind of have to. So then they just do this. They just downplay it in the headline because most Americans aren't going to read the details. Artificial sweeteners are awful, absolutely awful, and they should be pulled from the market. They won't be. All right, what else do we got today? What else was I pissed off about in the news? Oh, here's a good one. Um, I, I kind of fascinated with true crime. Um, I read a lot of true crime books. I watch some, you know, um, discovery crime and some of the uh, crime shows, the, the documentary type crime shows. Um, and it's incredible how we've gone back to clear cold cases, cases that had been worked on by teams for ever and never broken. And now we can. And a lot of it is technology. Better and better DNA is a big one. DNA um, profiling through websites like 23andMe. Now, there's another issue there with some, you know, freedom concerns and things like that. But it's pretty incredible, these, these really, really tough cases that are sometimes three decades old, and they solved them. There was just a big one I'm here recently. I think there's some serial killer on Long Island or something. They're just breaking a case there. So pretty incredible what we're able to do when it comes to solving crimes, except the one location in the country that should be the most secure and free of crime can't even figure out who left some cocaine in the White House. You have got to be kidding. And they've given up already. So we can solve crimes from 30 years ago, but it's it's already time to just say, oops, sorry, we can't figure this one out, so we're not even going to try. That's basically what the Department of Justice is saying. No, we can't figure it out, so we don't know who did it. But we can promise you the president's family wasn't even there. It wasn't Hunter. No way. Oh, uh, you can promise us that, but you can't. You've already given up trying to figure out who it is. Here's something else I fig- found out just looking into this a little bit. Uh, it turns out during 2022, they also found marijuana cannabis in the White House twice. I, you know, I could care less that there's cannabis in the White House. Hell, grow it in the garden. I don't care. But the White House cares or it's supposed to. That's not supposed to be in there. And it doesn't matter that it was cannabis. What matters is how the hell did it get there? And why don't we know who left it there? And Why haven't there been charges? It's a security issue. I don't really care about the drugs. People are going to do drugs. They do it all the time. Cannabis should just be legalized anyway. That's not the point. The point is, how can we have such horrendous security breaches in the White House and it's no big deal? When they first found the powder, uh, what if it's anthrax? They evacuated the building. But once they found out it's only cocaine and it's probably hunters, oh, we we should shut this down. Nothing to see here, folks. Move on. Unbelievable. I I just can't even believe we're at this point in our country. And half of the country thinks this is all okay. That's the really scary part. I don't know who these people are, but they they think all of this is just all okay. Um, In the White House, there's got to be cameras everywhere. There's to be crazy security. What about dogs? Don't we use drug dogs or bomb sniffing dogs? And most dogs that are trained for detection are, yes, that some of them are very specialized just for bombs. Most of these dogs can sniff out almost anything. They can sniff out drugs and guns and weapons and bombs and all kinds of stuff. How do we not know that drugs are being brought into the White House? I just don't get it. And... One of the ways they, you know, people have said, wait a minute, 
why don't we drug test everybody who had access to this as far as administration and staff? Oh, no. Drug test the government? Are you kidding? We'll drug test you as a truck driver, not the government. Oh, hell no. No, we're not going to invade their privacy and their rights over a little bit of cocaine in the White House. Uh, I should probably get to the calls. Um, Let's go to New York. Doug, welcome to the program. Good morning, Kevin. Uh, I'd like to address not only your open today, but your rant yesterday when uh, you had Chad on. You mentioned the government indoctrination system. I mean, educational system. Yes. I mean, government indoctrination system. How many schools now no longer teach our children cursive writing? Well, you might be surprised at my answer to that. You might be surprised. We might disagree on that one. I could care less about cursive writing. We don't teach kids how to tie up, how to rope off their horse and and make sure it's got water during the school day either. There was a time when kids rode horses to school in some places. Look, look, some things do become unnecessary. Look, let me make an analogy here. We still need to teach really good, strong math skills. I don't care if we have computers and calculators and things in our pocket that can do trigonometry. We need to know how that all happens. Nobody needs to know how to write in cursive. It really doesn't advance anything. It's not very necessary anymore. Um, printing is just fine because cursive was just a faster way to print. That, that let's, let's just be honest. It's the only reason we had cursive writing. It was just a faster way to write. When we used to write a lot, that made sense. Now somehow we have this nostalgic belief that we need to teach cursive writing, and I can't think of a single reason why. Uh, how about the foundations of our nation? No. No, it, like I said, this has not. Found- of course, they were written in cursive, and I just explained why. It became a more efficient right. way of writing. But guess what? Typing and our devices now, whether we like them or not, are 10 times more efficient than cursive. Remember, cursive was just a more efficient way of printing. Now we have way more efficient ways than cursive. There's no basic need for cursive writing, like the analogy with math. We do need to understand math. We can't just let the calculator do it because we won't know if it's wrong. But cursive writing serves no real purpose. Well, I understand and respect your position. However, with those two foundational documents having been written in cursive, anybody going through the indoctrination system has to trust that whoever has transcribed those documents and typed them or printed them has to trust that they have been transcribed accurately and completely. So well, it all hold comes on a down second. again hold to on control. A second. Yes, I get it. But, but this is, we need to pick our battles a little more carefully. First off, most people who can read printed writing will not have that hard of a time reading a cursive document. It's not that different. It's not like it's a whole different language. It's the same letters in a slightly different shape. Second off, okay, we need to verify that it was transcribed properly. That takes about two seconds, and once we do it, we're done. I mean, really, I I just don't. And nobody's ever taught that document in school anyway. We gave that up a long because time we got ago. Eating uh, uh, what But that we could go back to that. That may be a better topic. But you brought up the cursive writing, and I think this is just a big non-issue. Civics? No, that's different. You we, we could have a better civics educational program. I could completely agree with that. I just don't see the cursive writing Ron- thing being a, a hill to die on. Ro- uh, Ronald Reagan put it most succinctly, the nine scariest words in the English language are, I'm from the government, and I'm here to help. I get that, but what does that have to do with cursive writing? Again, it's basically making it more difficult for our children. It's not more difficult, it's easier. No, it's it's much, much easier to read 
plain printed text than it is cursive writing. Cursive writing is more efficient to write. It's less efficient to read. Believe me, I'm a big reader. The last thing I would ever want to try to do is read a book written in cursive. Oh, that would just give me a headache. Of course. So that's what I'm saying. You're, you've got this nostalgic attachment to this cursive writing for no real good reason. It, it's just not a thing. It, we want to be able to communicate with the written word. Let's just do it the most efficient way possible. I can agree with you there. Let's move on to something much better like civics. Yeah, I totally agree with you. We, we Even when I went to school, honestly, I will tell you, there was one civics class required while I was in high school. I had to take it for one semester, and that was it. And honestly, it, it's a much more complicated topic than you can cover in one semester. I remember nothing from that class. <laughs> I, I agree with you there. And as, as for, you know, the way our government pushes for college education, college education, college education, some people are not cut out for college. Some people are cut out for working with their hands, using their minds to fix a problem and translating that through their hands. We need trades. We need plumbers. We need electricians. We need diesel mechanics. We need mechanics. Couldn't agree more. And, the government and should, that should start, in my opinion, that should start in high school. The your entire four years of high school, we should have very, very separate tracks for people. That, so if you want absolutely. to go into the trades, you start learning trades early on. You start learning a lot about that trade. Why not teach things like independent contractors? Let's teach you how to be a good independent contractor. A lot of trades use independent contractors. So if we start early, not only can we teach you the skills required to be a good carpenter, or plumber, or electrician, we can also teach you how to manage that as an independent contractor. We have lots of time now. So there's one track. There's a, a track for people who want to go to college. And let's focus on, but let's get even more specific about that. Let's make this a lot of these college training programs much, much more practical and a lot less theory. And we wouldn't need six more years of school for most things. So uh, yeah, True. you and I could probably spend all day on what a mess our whole education system is and, and come up with, you know, 20 good ways to improve it. Yeah, unfortunately, it wouldn't be much of a debate because for the most part, we're on the same side of the argument. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, anyway, I'll I, step aside so you can get other callers. Got it. Thanks for the call. Um, I, I was just thinking about this this morning. I was working on my schedule and I'm trying to figure out, you know, how much radio time I can do, how much Twitter time I'm going to do. And I was thinking about the pushback on Twitter. Uh, and I'm still getting it, which, you know, it's just part of what I do. You got to deal with it. But if I didn't have something like Twitter, at least one other platform, and all we were doing was spending time on our websites and with our tribe, that's just not healthy. That's what's called an echo chamber. And I really, really try to avoid that. I really try to make sure I'm exposed to other opinions. Here was a good example. Um, the idea of cursive writing, uh, by debating that a little bit, you just sharpen your arguments. You, you start to think through these issues. And I have changed my mind, maybe not completely on a lot of issues, but I can think about them differently after debating somebody or just talking to somebody. Uh, it doesn't have to be a debate or confrontational. You just talk about something. Uh, but But you start thinking about it in new ways. So... I do want to continue with that exposure to new people and have new opinions and, and new conversations. Let's go to Texas this time. Paul, welcome to the program. How, um, do you think a lot of this that's going on between the Biden family and the border and all that, that's the people that have got their hand out to get or debt canceled. The other ones that are okay with it. Yeah, 
Yeah. yeah, absolutely. I mean, we we are seeing a very, very clear divide in the country. And it, it's not that it hasn't been there, that it, this isn't new. It's reached a point where it's hard to see how you turn back from this. That That's what feels different to me. Everything happened so fast that the trigger for everything seemed to be COVID. And things would went just yeah. kind of went to hell. And, and we were looking around saying, hey, wait a minute. Is the Australian government really locking people up in camps because they they won't take a shot? Uh, and it wasn't just our country. It's, a, it's the whole world going through a lot of this right now. You know, Europe, we don't hear much about it unless you really watch the news. Europe has been dealing with these immigration border crises for a long time. Europe is being overrun by immigrants. It's And again, it's the same thing. It's government saying, hey, wait a minute. These people around the world who have nothing are so easy to control. Let's just bring more of them into our country. I, I really believe that's what's going on. Uh-oh, we lost Paul. I didn't even see that call drop. Um, well, let's go to Matt in Mississippi. Welcome. Good morning, Kevin. What are you doing in Mississippi? Oh, uh, well, it's... Is that the way you come back? Or... Alabama and Mississippi. Yeah. Yep. Huh. We got a delivery right. in New Albany and at noon. Oh, okay. Central time, but um, just on the the whole curse of writing thing. Yeah. Remember the story of Paul Revere? Uh, and maybe you not. Know, you see one lamp. Oh, yeah. One lantern or two lanterns. Right. One if by sure land, one. two if by sea. Yeah. Yeah. Do we use lanterns anymore? <laughs> no, we really don't. Um, I, I, you know, yeah. I, I I get some things we, we shouldn't change over time. Some things should stay the same. But we should also be careful that we don't get some weird nostalgic attachment to something. And, and cursive writing, that this issue has always been a little odd to me, why people think this is really a big deal. No. Well, I mean, I get the reason, I, and I don't even disagree with it, because of our founding papers are written in cursive, so I, you know, I understand I, that. I don't know that I've ever even noticed or heard that argument. Well, yeah, that's the biggest one floating but, around that I've so, seen. So how many documents so, are we talking about? I pretty but, sure most of the original documents okay. anything so, that's handwritten so what is were cursive. what were they written on and what were they written with well they were, the original ones were uh with a quail with ink and I don't know the type of paper, but it's not the same as what we use today. So if this is so important that they were written in cursive, shouldn't we be teaching kids how to write with with quail? tipped ink pens on papyrus because that's how this was done. And if that's the important part yep. that this document was written that way, well, then let's teach it all. But come on, does that make any practical sense? Oh. No, no, or, or it doesn't at all. The, the, what's important about the documents that they were written in cursive or the words? Some people can. Well, all, just like so, we were. Some people can only read the documents in Braille. They're blind. Does it change the meaning, though? No. Um, we were talking on Wednesday about soap making. Yeah. That used to be a class in school, too. I, I'll bet it was. You're right. I bet we could go back and find all kinds of crazy. But didn't we used to have, like, archery and, and um, uh, what's the word I want to use? Like, shooting. There's a, a, I well, know there's a better word. Yep. Um, yep. We used to teach kids how to shoot weapons in school. Those were classes. Why don't we bring those back? No. Those are still useful. Yes. Yeah. Why did we get rid of classes that are useful? Wood shop, metal shop. Why aren't we screaming about those things instead of about cursive writing? Every you know? every kid in school so. knows how to communicate with words. They can text them. They've, they've butchered the hell out of them. But you know what? You can still read what they're writing. But we yeah. stop teaching the things that would be practical to know. I, I'm sure well, yeah, there, there, a... there were classes on gardening at some point. 
Well, yeah, as you say, gardening and even butchering an animal. Right. Uh, and Let's go back to teaching meat. that. The list is probably so long, you know, because we don't think about it. But because Mike Beckett uses basket weaving. Right. He said that, you know, a couple different times because that was important that at was, one point in time. But It was a very important skill at one well, time, you know, right. Yep. And, you know, if if we follow the, uh, you know, world's coming to an end type thing, that it would still be important. That's exactly why they're not going to teach it. Society crashes. Yep. That's exa- They don't want us to know that kind of stuff. I fully believe the government does not want to teach anybody about any kind of self-sufficiency because that's the opposite of control. You can't control somebody that can feed themselves. It becomes much more difficult to control them. So, it, yeah, at our, our school system, we can clearly see they will not teach anything practical. Now, let's talk about some stuff that I don't believe has ever really been taught in our school system. We could say that some of those really practical things were taught and they've gone away. But I don't believe we've ever really taught good financial and money management in school. Exactly. And that's uh, something I just listened to between the money guy show, Dave Ramsey show, and you've been talking about, you know, the real estate market and can't understand why it's still as strong as it is. So here, here's a couple of interesting facts that are playing out over the next couple of years. Because of COVID and the low interest rates, when we're talking commercial now, commercial real estate, a lot of people would have refinanced at the really, really low interest. And most commercial loans are five years. So a lot of these people that aren't being forced to refinance right now, you know, so there is commercial real estate that's failing because they're getting forced to refinance and now the numbers don't work with higher interest. But there's going to be a huge lump of that coming up in 2025. So it's going to get way worse than it is right now. You know, I keep reading about things like you're talking about that we're missing things just under the surface in a lot of industries and areas. And like, look, you and I know a lot about what's going on in trucking, right? because we pay attention to it every day. It's our industry. We talk it's, about yep. it. We read about Daily. it. Daily, yep. Yeah, but do, I didn't know anything about car dealers and their business models and until I started following some car guy on Twitter that kind of does what I do, but he does it for car dealers. So the guy knows that whole industry inside and out, and I'm reading stuff from him thinking, wow, why am I not seeing this anywhere? This is important. He had one today on... Car dealers keep reporting that their used car sales are still strong and there's plenty of profit there. Well, it turns out there really isn't. They, they, the dealers don't even understand. And you think, oh, come on, the dealers have to know. Oh, no, wait a minute. How many small trucking companies do we talk to that don't understand what's going on in trucking? Lots of them. So there are car dealers out there that really don't. Right. So it, it, and then I, I, I mean, I knew a little bit about commercial real estate, but I follow a guy who does nothing but consult on commercial real estate. And it's incredible what I'm learning from this guy. But you don't see this information anywhere else. Uh, ocean shipping. I never knew much about ocean shipping. I didn't care about containers until they landed on our property here in the U.S. But that's a big, big deal, ocean shipping. I follow some guy that all he does is consult on ocean shipping. And it's incredible what I'm learning. Yep. And following a guy about that, too. And that's it's crazy how volatile that is. Oh, oh unbelievable. It I mean, went we from. heard about how crazy it got it, with COVID. Yeah. But, it, it went from like $20,000 to ship a container to 1500 Yep. It, crazy it went, volatility. So, yeah, just some of them numbers. Pre COVID, it was about 1800 I believe. From Shanghai to L.A. Okay. That was the average spot market. And then it went all the way up to 20000 Right. And now, well, I don't know about right now, but I know six months ago, it had dropped below 2019 rates. 
Yes. The 1,500. Yep. That, those are the two numbers I remembered, the 20,000 and the 1,500, and I thought that was the, the right issue. That's insane. Oh. Now, now think about some of these giant container ships. How many containers do they carry? I always get these numbers mixed. Up. I know, I do too. It's they're so big, I can't remember them. I know. They always size them by 20-foot containers, even though the majority are 40-foot. Right. So that's where it also gets confusing. But it, it's 20,000 or 40,000. I can't remember the number now, but it's a lot. So a, a better number would be if we just knew the revenue that it was generating at the peak, because sure, a 40 foot takes up more space. I'm sure they're charging more for it too. It's all about space. So what we really yep. would need is what, uh, at the very peak of those prices, what was the largest contain? I'd want to know that number. Tell me about the largest container ship in the world and how much revenue it was generating on one trip at the peak. And then look at the difference now. Because if one container dropped from twenty thousand dollars to fifteen hundred, do you know how big that number is going to be? Yeah, and that's one well, trip across the ocean. Interesting. The pole for going through the Panama Canal is based on the size of the boat, obviously. Right. Just like you know, our toll roads. Most of them are right. per axle. Right. Yep. Some of them big ships. It's two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. <laughs> One way. Quarter million dollars just to go through the Panama Canal. Isn't that insane? Some of these numbers are just so big you can't get your head around them. Nope. Imagine, imagine, you know, nope. I, I want to be the toll collector. Ooh, here comes another ship. Oh, another quarter <laughs> million dollars. I'm sure that's not how it works, but that'd be fun, wouldn't it? I want to oh, be yeah. that toll collector. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> pocket a bill here and there but <laughs> oh man yeah. um so back to uh real estate so on the residential market right now there's still a shortage of homes being put into the market and part of that reason is because higher interest rates people that are at their max payment that they can afford they technically can't afford to sell their house and move somewhere else no. because just to even stay in the same size house, their mortgage is going to go way up when they you know, buy and sell and get a new mortgage at a higher interest rate. Well, let's think so, about let, I did some math on this the other day. Let me interject that math right here. Yep. If the house they're in currently, they bought back in 2020, let's say, and they could afford $2,400 a month, they bought a $700,000 house back then. When they sell now and go to buy another house for the same 2400 a month, they can only afford a $450,000 house now. That's backwards. Most people, when they move out of a house, want to move up, not down. Empty nesters are the only people that downsize usually. So that's insane. You're right. Those people can't buy and yeah. sell. And what happens when they're forced to they, for some reason? They can't even afford. They can't even afford to downsize. It, right. You're right. They can't. They, it, it's insane how much that has changed. No, yeah. but here's something that's going to change that. So with the shortage of homes and the shortage of lumber and all that, following COVID, we have a big boom of building. They say that takes about two years, you know, between the planning, you know, all the cities and developing the add on and the permitting and actually building houses. They're figuring there's going to be a flood of new homes coming on the end of this year and all uh, 24. I can give you an example. New homes are going to be cheaper than used. I can give you so, an example. You know where I live. You've been here. Pretty small town, right? Pretty small neighborhood. Yeah. You know? Um, I, I can look out my window right now and see where they're building 41 new homes, 41 new homes. They're, they're clear. They're doing all the dirt work right now. And they d had to do massive amounts of dirt work. They're still at it. They've been at it for months. This is just to try to get the land ready to build on. There's not a single foundation going in yet. There probably won't be for at least another month. And then they'll start building. There's 41 homes in a little town. So what you're talking about, there's another interesting aspect to this. And I've been reading about it because um, real estate is kind of my thing now. Um, 
if you've understood real estate forever, uh, for as long as I can remember, if you if the way you wanted to invest, there's lots of different ways to invest in real estate. You could be, be buying land, you know, raw land and then planning to develop it someday or just sitting on it, waiting to resell it. You could be flipping homes. You could be uh, building or buying sh- uh, short term like vacation rentals. That's kind of the the biggest part of the market I'm interested in. And you could also be buying and managing long term rentals. And in long term rentals, traditionally, what has been the worst investment? Single family homes. Single family yeah. homes have never been a good rental investment. There's not enough margin for all the hassle and risk you have to take. As soon as you do even a duplex, the numbers look much better. Do a triplex, they look even better. Do an eight unit little apartment complex and the profit gets even better. It's always been about multiple units. So that has now changed. Guess what currently is the most profitable rental segment? The single family home. Yes, and there's a huge shortage of them. That's why they are now all of a sudden, they went from being the worst um, rental market in real estate to now the best. That's crazy. But that again is a lot of people getting into it that don't really know because that was something else one of the interviews i heard on the money guy show they interviewed a real estate guy i just listened to this last night i think the interview was from back in may but uh people you know assume that that's big corporate got into that which they did but still that's only in certain segments certain cities Right. Nationwide, corporate ownership of single family homes is barely 1%, I think, today. You know, it looked in in the rental industry. Yeah, there was a pattern that had started to take hold, and it looked like that was really becoming a problem, like BlackRock and these big funds buying homes and um, even companies like the, the real estate companies like Zillow that were just software platforms yep. s- started buying divisions and they were out buying homes and they were driving prices up crazy. They were overbidding on stuff. They figured out pretty quick. I, I don't know how they got that so wrong. It seemed like they figured out pretty quick that that was a really bad idea and they started to back off. So I, I think we got worried because yep. it looked like it was really becoming a problem, but you're right. It's not. That whole kind of thing just collapsed. Yeah. So, yeah, that, and that, I mean, just historically, it's never made sense to own single family homes as a. Just doesn't. As a but, business. And yeah, like you're saying, it, the numbers just don't work very well. I, I'm, I, I was somewhat tempted when I read that. We have a, a couple of realtors watching the market for us. In fact, one of them was just over here the other day uh, because I'm in that market. And, and most of what keeps coming up right now are just single family properties. I'm in an area where there's just not a lot of properties anyway. Um, and, and we'll go look at them just because the more I look, the more I understand the market. Uh, And I got tempted. I I thought, well, man, if this is the most profitable asset class now, maybe I should be looking at some of these deals. I don't think I'm going to. I think this is short term. I I don't think this is a good long term move. Yeah, well, I could say, you know, we get flooded with new construction homes over the next year. And, you know, them because the guy said, you know, we can research this because it's all permitted. Right. The number of permits that have been drawn every year the last couple of years is way up. Yep. And like I say, you know, it takes it takes a year or two to build a house from the day you start permitting processes and actually get it done. So yeah, that those numbers are going to go way up, and so that's going to change the real estate market as as yes. the number of available homes starts flooding the market. Yeah. So again, I, I'm in this um, position where. We're in such a weird market. Nothing makes sense anymore. It's it's a little scary to be thinking about investing in anything right now. But I am also, I'm afraid to hold yeah. on to all the cash I'm holding on to. <laughs> well, so that's actually the main reason for my call was about the stock market. Uh, the S&P 500 closed last night 
at 166 points shy of its record high. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. We've added 105 points already this week. So that means if this trend continues by the end of next week, by, you know, next Friday, we could see a record high uh, S&P did, 500. Or did, did, very possibly before the end of the month. Where, where are all the market timers? How is this working out for them? Well, they all jumped in back in October. <laughs> so that was the bottom. Sure they did. Of course they did. Everybody knew October was made, the bottom. And they've made almost 25% return on their investment. Yeah, except they didn't. You're right. They should have. Well, myself. <laughs> I know. Nobody does. Because nobody was saying October was the bottom. And is this the top? <laughs> If we set a record, is that the top? I would have to say no, well, but I, I, I can't imagine how much risk there is at this point in the market. I, I, in a typical recession, we lose 50% of the market. That's happened a couple of times. And we lost. We're, we're in a we recession. Percent. Yeah. And well, in 2022, we lost 22%. Right. Right, but, which we felt yeah. like, okay, we're about halfway to the bottom, except we weren't. We're now back at the top again. Uh, yeah. And like I said, I don't, I, I've been saying for years now, hold on to your cash, opportunities are coming. And I've been doing it. And now I'm sitting here looking at my cash, worried about it. I'm worried about inflation eating away the value of it. I'm worried about the banks. I, I I don't want to be sitting on a bunch of cash right now, but I don't know what to do with it. So Paul sent me a couple texts here. <laughs> he said he'll take some of your money and help you move it. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I don't even want to. Inv- I don't want to invest it into the business right now either, because I'm afraid of a long extended yep. recession. Uh, he did give me the number on the container ships. The largest one is twenty four thousand. TEUs, which is 20 foot equivalent unit. Okay. So that'd be 12,000 40 footers. So 24,000 short containers. Yeah. 12,000. Well, you might as well just go with the short because I have a feeling the longer yeah. it charges double anyway. So you're still really pricing this on 20 foot units. So do the math, or I will. Got a calculator up here. Um, so the difference between 20,000 and 1500 is 18,500. That's the difference times the number of 20 footers, which was how many? 12,000. Well, it was on 40 footers. Oh, so half so, then. 12,000. 12,000. Yep. Okay. Uh, oh my God, the number's too big. I gotta, and my calculator doesn't pull them. <laughs> My calculator doesn't doesn't put in commas, so uh, let's see. It is two hundred and twenty two million dollars per trip, less. No, yep. I can't even get my head around that. And we're we're complaining about our rates in trucking. <laughs> Jeez. Oh wait, now, a minute. wait a minute. Are there? Clear, are, hold on. Hold on. Are there brokers involved in this ocean shipping container stuff? It's the broker's fault, I'm sure. Yeah, there. Well, there's always a broker. That term is used, but I don't think it's the same. Now, there's there's freight forwarders that are involved in this kind of stuff, and I don't have a really good understanding of that industry at all. And there's also what we call a broker that handles the. Um, the paperwork with international shipments. I can't right. remember the terminology. It's been so long since I've crossed the border yeah. with uh, with freight. But our, our our regular listeners across the border are screaming the answer out of the radio. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so you know what? That's all right. Yeah, um, but that's insane. So yeah, uh, one last thing I heard on Dave Ramsey's show, and it's the argument about interest rates and not paying down your home mortgage because you can invest, you know, if you have a two and a half percent mortgage, but you can get a money market at 5%, aren't you smarter to put the money in the money market? 
instead of pay extra on your home loan. So, and on the surface, the math all works and it makes sense. And I know why but it let's doesn't. Put this but into go ahead. Reality. Right. Yeah. The average home loan is a hundred and some thousand dollars that you're paying two and a half percent on. Right. What do you? So we got a number of you know three four hundred bucks a month in interest. Depending on where you are in the, the mortgage, average, right? Yep. What do you think the average person is truly saving and putting in a money market? <laughs> I, I'm afraid to know. The that average is, it's almost zero. Well, he didn't give these numbers. He was just giving the examples. Yeah. So I, I right. put some math to it. Let's go crazy and say it's actually fifty thousand dollars. Okay. That's a hundred bucks a month in interest. Uh, yeah. So you're paying three or four hundred dollars a month. So. That, and not paying extra on that so that you can earn a hundred dollars a month. To me, that's still a negative number. Of course it is. That makes no sense. Right. (laughs) Just, just pay off the debt and and be done with it. But there's another factor here too. Every time somebody who is for this, like I said, when I was going through my CFP program, I had one instructor, professor, whatever the hell they were. This was his whole thing. And remember I, I was going through my CFP, P program at the late 90s. I think I started it in either late 98 or early 99. And then I sat for my CFP in 01. And I'll always remember it because it was right around uh, uh, 9-11. I actually, my, I had, I had scheduled like those weekend cram courses uh, to get ready for my exam. And several of them got canceled because of 9-11. So I'll always remember that's when I was sitting for mine. Uh, He pushed this hard. The one thing they always do is they they calculate this on like the the life of your mortgage. Well, mortgages run 30 years for most people. These interest rates are not lasting for 30 years. They never have. So why would we so but they use this. Oh, look, if you do this and you can gain 5% in the money market and you're only paying 2%, you do that for 30 years, you make $300,000. But nobody ever does it for 30 years because the rates never last that long. This is always short-term stuff. Yeah, and the only way you can even make it work is if you're talking about putting it in your retirement account and not touching it. And it being tax-free or tax-deferred, right, right. Majority of people, they're just, they want to hold on to cash. And, And I'm not against that. I mean, you said it too, you know, this volatility and uncertainty, you want to have cash. And I completely agree with that. But the average person out here, if they did have the ability to actually save $50,000 cash, that is extremely rare to begin with. Right. Yeah. But majority of people, if they could, they'd be out going buying a brand new car, a brand new boat, something yep. as soon as they had enough money to do it. Yep. That's absolutely well, what happened. As soon happens. as they had a 20, 30, 40% down payment, they'd go do it. <laughs> they, they, they just can't yep. stay consistent and keep saving. Yeah, so exactly. That's, that's so the American way. So, and, and again, we're back to almost everything Dave Ramsey teaches is like this, and he's been attacked for decades over it, and people use math. No, look, math is always right. Here's the math. Well, you're right. The math is right except math and the real world are two different things. If everybody did exactly what they were supposed to do with that money, it would work. If everybody went out and got 10 credit cards or two or whatever and charged everything they lived on on that credit card and then paid it off at the end of the month, and and why couldn't you do that? You're already paying all those bills, right? So why couldn't you... Go put it all on a credit card every month, pay it all off at the end of the month. You had to pay for it anyway and collect the points and all the benefits it, uh, on paper. Doesn't that work perfectly? It's like you get a whole bunch of free stuff. All I had to do was use this card instead of writing a check right now. Then at the end of the month, I'll write one check for all of this. And I get all these points and bonuses and cash back from my credit card. That makes total sense, except it doesn't work in the real world and never has. Not for most people. And there until, are clearly people that do yep, it. The we average do. person. Yeah. Until their car breaks down and they got to repair it, or they're sick and they miss the work a week. Uh, a week of work and that, you know, their paycheck, it 
So something happens and it doesn't work. Do you, you know the best example I saw of this? The year I was working with ATBS, the, I was technically part of their management team for a year. Uh, and I, my studio was in their building and I traveled with them. They had a private jet. They had a nine passenger private jet. And Todd, the owner, I, I, Todd and I were good friends. Everything for that jet got put on a credit card. We are talking huge amounts of money. Fuel, parts, and parts, I learned so much. That is insane. You know that little clip, that, that little piece of plastic that's on the, the seat belt? I'm not even sure what it does. It moves around and slides, and I, I don't even really know what its purpose is. Do you know how much that little piece of plastic cost for an airplane? And this was years ago. I'm sure it's worse now. $750. No. Because every what? single part has to be go through all of this crazy government testing to be approved. And so everything for that plane, all the fuel, all the landing fees, all the parts, all the maintenance, everything got put on credit cards. It's not because Todd didn't have the money to pay the bills. He earned huge amounts of rewards through that card. Um, well, I'll, I'll give a, a personal example of that. <clears throat> um you know, I use Nastic, but I also have the mud flap uh, fuel card. Yeah. And on there, they, they just, everything's built through a credit card. They now have, well, or a debit card. They're now, I don't know when it started in the last month, or maybe it's just certain areas, certain fuel stops. If you use a debit card, you'll get, say, six cents a gallon cheaper. I get 2% cash back on my credit card. So six cents a gallon is $3 a gallon for to make up that six cents. Okay. So if fuel is above above $3 a gallon, I'm making more money by using my credit card and paying six cents more than if I use a debit card. So I'm getting more than six cents cash back. Right. Yeah. So I use my credit card and 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 pay a higher price per gallon. On paper, this all the math makes sense. And the way you do it makes sense. The way I do it, we, we, spend a ton of money on our business credit card and it all gets paid off at the end of the month. We never carry a balance. Uh, we've got plenty of cash sitting, you know, in the business account just as well, because I've been telling people, if you've got a business, you should be, you know, hoarding cash. Um, but we get all kinds of benefits from doing that. But have you ever heard me recommend that to anybody? No, because I, I don't know nope. that these people have the discipline to make that work. So I would not teach and recommend something like that. Dave Ramsey's the same way. Everything he teaches is is really kind of ultra conservative when it comes to money, but it works. Nope. Uh, were you going to do a Twitter space today? I see it's we've I am. top of the hour. I am, but I didn't schedule it, so... Uh, I, I think okay. um, I think I've got one more call in the queue, so I think I'm going to suspend the calls so right. we don't I'll get any new ones. All right, well, uh, you going to be on the space Just today? Twitter. All right, see you then. For a little bit. All right, All see right. you then. Bye. It'll be uh, shortly after we end this call. I'm not, it, probably uh, nine thirty Pacific time is what we'll do the space today. Uh, I do have another call, so let's grab it. Let's go to. Nebraska. Brad, welcome to the program. Oh, good morning, everybody. Hey, just wanted a quick and dirty lowdown 101 on pusher lift axles. What have we learned over the past 15 years? I know that Volvo has the adaptive loading system. Do we have anything that'll come close in the uh, aftermarket section? Not easy. No, I've, I haven't seen anything. And I'm not saying it's not out there. I haven't gone and looked for a while. But I'm not aware of anything that would make now putting in a lift axle forward is pretty simple. But it's the it's the adaptive loading and traction control and some of those other things that the OEMs have have really built nice systems. And we I, I don't know of a good equivalent for that in the aftermarket. So mostly in the aftermarket, we're recommending it for people who kind of understand just how to manage that themselves. There are some pretty quick hacks you can do with with airbags and valves, and um, they're but they're not like plug and play. Okay, I mean, I would 
the main advantage would be gaining the fuel mileage by not having to drive a power divider. Uh, yeah, I'm and the, the downside to not having the traction control isn't so much traction or the weight um, shifting. It's more tire wear. That That's the biggest advantage to having those. It really evens out the tire wear. We did notice that with a, a just a manual forward lift that you you lose significant amounts of tire life on that back axle now it was still cost effective because fuel is a much much bigger expense than tires are i mean tires it turns out not only have um tire tires have gotten significantly more expensive but the interesting thing is their cost per mile has not changed in about a decade so every time tires get more expensive they must be lasting a lot longer too because the cost per mile on tires hasn't changed in a decade. Um, so, yeah, okay. it, with a manual setup, if you didn't do some kind of hack, you're going to go through rear tires faster, um, but it's still cost effective. Now, if we can get control of that tire cost, then it's even more cost effective. Okay, just running it. I guess if you had, uh, would guys do maybe two air gauges, one for the back? bags it, one for the front bags th- there are several different hacks around this i've seen yeah and then you know te- okay. technically i think we used to talk about this a lot i think it's actually illegal to have a control valve for that lift axle up in the cab but we recommend doing probably it. yeah we recommend doing it yeah i doubt that anybody's ever well, going that- to give you a hassle i doubt that any inspector is even going to realize it's there or pay any attention to it or um, so we've seen some pretty good hacks with gauges and valves up in the dash. So you can do it right from your seat. Um, there's a couple ways of, and we've just seen people that said, look, I'm just going to throw the lift axle in. I'm not going to worry about weight biasing at all. Oh, well, yeah, I would like the idea of having the, uh, full locking rear end for, uh, in inclement weather or mud and dirt and stuff. So, yeah, I, I do too. I will say the, f- the, the two signature trucks we built did, did had just a basic manual lift axle, no weight biasing, no nothing. Okay. Okay. But yeah, no, looking at a 99 Volvo, the 127 Detroit. So heading down that four man you know, signature it, route. Yeah, and, and here's the interesting thing. When when we're buying a used truck and converting this, it, it there are ways to, you know, if you can do the work yourself, that helps a lot. I've talked about when I used to buy tandem axles and convert them to single axles because I pulled doubles. I, I had a deal going for a while where as long as the truck was new enough, I had my shop would do the whole conversion for me at no charge. They sold all no. the parts as long as they were new enough. And and I think if I remember right, they wanted everything under 100,000 miles. And I, that's that was my target for used trucks anyway. I always try to find one-year-old used trucks, low mileage. Um, they're out there. They're harder to find. They're harder to find with the right specs, but that's part of doing the hard work. And as long as that truck was under 100,000 miles and there were always two stipulations for my shop, they would never give me a time estimate. It'll get done when it gets done because we're only going to have people work on it when they have nothing else to do. And as long as I was okay Okay. with those two stipulations and I was fine, I knew that I could plan for it. I could buy the truck early and then just go let it sit over their shop. When they get to it, they'll get to it. And as long as I allowed them those two things, you do whatever you want. You get all the parts, tires, wheels, rims, brakes, differentials, springs, everything, bag, airbag, you get it all. Um, I just want the truck back as a single axle. And they did several of them for me like that, no charge. Okay. I've talked to my local shop, and unfortunately, it won't be a no charge situation, but <laughs> a little different, though. Well, but you're, you're right. You're, you, they're, they're going to get 20-some-year-old parts. It's not a lot of value in those, sure. in those parts for them. So I, I get it. Like I said, the stipulation, two big ones. One, truck had to have less than 100,000 miles on it, and I had to be okay with it sitting there for six weeks. Yeah, that ship sailed about 20 years ago so, uh, it, for this truck. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so. uh, the other thing I, I was going to ask is I have seen a certain carrier out of uh, Norwalk, Ohio, that begins with P. has got a few of their VNMs that are coming offline. Oh boy! Ended up at a dealership. Yeah. They've already got, the, they've already got the adaptive loading and stuff and the D11. And I was just wondering, I was going to be doing, 
some kind of road construction, but other times just pulling a flatbed. I was wondering, is the D11 up for, uh, you know, 80,000 gross on a continuous basis? Uh, if it were 80,000 all the time, now 80,000 local, I'd probably be okay. 80,000 over the road, if it were all the time, I don't think I'd want the 11 liter. Okay. I like the 11 liter. Yeah, I think when I mean, it, we, we don't know much about the D11 because there just aren't that many of them. Uh, my guess is these trucks were their local P&D that did more of their local and regional stuff. That's probably, but you could also ask Joel um, why they, these are the D11s and what the specs are like and what he'll, he'll tell you about the performance in the fleet. I mean, he's still very tied in. Uh, to that operation. It's his family. Um, so if you're interested mm-hmm. in one of those trucks, I would schedule a call with Joel or uh, come on our Twitter space today and ask him. Oh, okay. Yeah. Joel's probably yelling at his radio right I'm now. I'm sure he is. He's going to be on our Twitter space. So come on and ask him about these trucks. I, I, I want to know about them. I'd be interested in them and not that I'm in the market to buy anything, but uh, they might be really interesting trucks. Yeah, I'm, I don't have to be to the, and I hate, I didn't want to say it because they'll probably all be sold before I get over there from Nebraska. So. And and the other thing Joel will be able to tell us, and I just don't have enough feedback on this because there just aren't enough of them. He'll be able to tell us how those things perform with weight. You know, are they, did they have any startability issues? Um, I, I'm sure we'll get a lot of information about those trucks. Yeah, they're, they were ice shift. I don't think they were, you know, they, well, I think they were. The, that's one thing I'd want to ask him: Were they the twelve-speed ice shift, or were they the thirteen-speed ice shift? Or because they ranged in years from two thousand fourteen to two thousand seventeen. Yeah, he would again. The ones he, that, I, I, that I saw. You know, I can't think of a better resource for these specific trucks. They came from his family's fleet, and and Joel's always been tied in. Oh. I mean, he was the guy for a long time that that really worked on a lot of these specs. Yeah, that's. I'm trying to get over my fear of uh, emissions, of uh, <laughs> emission costs and stuff. I, the problem is you get on forums and you you only see the guys that have problems. You don't correct. see the guys that have been running. And, and look, I, I will a, conf- a confirmation by it. I, I will still say that emissions are still an issue for the industry. They're really not much of an issue for us anymore. We've done enough work to know which years, what specs they should be. If they had problems, is is the catalyst going to work? Will another strategy work? Um, if we re-gear these, can we get away from some of these? Pro- we know enough about emissions now that I'm not afraid of them. But that doesn't mean that all these trucks are going to be trouble-free when it comes to emissions, not even close because we still are specking them wrong, we're driving them wrong, we're maintaining them wrong. You are going to hear about emission problems for probably another decade. And then, like cars, it will eventually just go away completely, I think. And who knows, by then we'll all be driving hydrogen something. I don't know. Well, you never know. But I figured if any fleet knew how to deal with emissions, it'd probably be this one. Well, they, they focused on it. They understood it. They specced to get around it. They understood that there were ways to run these trucks and spec them differently to avoid and minimize a lot of these. And then we did find that, look, there are some fuel additives that help this. There are some maintenance strategies that help. Most fleets do not focus on this kind of stuff. They're so busy trying to keep drivers in seats and move freight. They never get around to this. They don't get around to fuel economy. They don't get around to maintenance costs. They just spec this, whatever the dealer recommends or whatever they've been specking for the last couple of years, they just spec it again. Yeah. Yeah. I can hear Bruce logging into Twitter right now when you said catalyst. So, yeah, there you go. (laughs) Well, we better get on the Twitter spaces in. So uh, thanks for the info. You're we'll welcome. see you there. All right. Yep. We're going to head over there. We'll uh, we'll make it 930 for the official Twitter space start. I don't even think I scheduled it yet. So I better get on there and do that. Uh, we'll see you then. Be safe. Be profitable. Be fit and healthy. Always do the hard work and master the journey.